some coins and put them in their pocket. And instead of writing their budget constraint and access demand function like that, I change the budget constraints. I don't change the access demand function because the access demand function for each good remains the same. The total demand for bananas has to be less or equal to the total supply of bananas. The total right, demand for water is less or equal than the total supply of water. That's measured in bottles of water, bananas, apples, shoes. These don't change. These change. Right? In the standard model, without money, I write the budget constraint in this form, and I set what? I set one price as a numerator. Right? I say, good number one, Castraure e Santerasmo, their price is one. So everything is expressed in Castraure e Santerasmo. That if you're not from here, you don't know what they are. How many people know? Nobody knows. Well, if you're here, they're done, they're gone now. The season is over. But if you are here next spring, go somewhere and ask in a restaurant, a risotto with castraure, it's very nice. It's a, huh? it's a particular small artichoke. Uh, but obviously, they're not all for Santerasmo. In the old days, they are now they are grown in other places. People from around here find them particularly, particularly good. Me too, when they're good, but they're very good. Uh, <laughs> now, local uh, local uh, culinary uh, uh, specialties aside, this is expressed in what? In unit of the numerator. In the Patinkin approach, in the initial approach, what money does is purely change the numerator. It says, okay, numerator is no longer Castraure, it's this thing I call the dollar. What is the dollar? Oh, it's something you got in the pocket to start. You have your supplies, that is, you had your endowment. Right? The endowment vector, you're born with that in the model. Well, now you're also born with a little pile of things that we call the dollar. Notice that this is the origin of the helicopter money. Now, for example, I've become a big critic of the helicopter money, but like many other people, but why? Not because the, the model of helicopter money is stupid or incoherent. The model of helicopter money is very useful to understand lots of things. Not the way monetary policy works now. But it's very useful to understand anything that happened since probably the 1500. When money in the pocket was mostly coins in some form of precious metal issued by some political or military authority and used by it through seniorage to buy goods, mostly for wars. Okay? Because in that form, that money ended up very quickly in the pocket of consumer and households. And what is it the helicopter model of money does? The helicopter model of money does, as in Patinkin, Patinkin is an helicopter model of money, is to put the coins in the pocket of people. It calls money that thing that is in your pocket. Or at most if you want in your checking account in a world in which banks do nothing else but the payment system. One says, oh, but it's also the checking account. Yes, but in that model, I restrict my focus so that the thing I care about bank is that they carry out, they manage, they, they are the payment system. They don't do credit evaluation, they don't create uh, inside money, they don't issue credit, they don't decide whom to lend or not to lend, they don't do open market operation standing on the other side of the central bank, they don't have a portfolio of investment, no. They receive deposit and they make payment. Okay? So they're part of the helicopter money thing because you don't need to have the pile of dollars here on the table. On the table you may have a checking account or a credit card that says you can spend up to 5,000. This is in the checking account, right? That's the helicopter money. In the helicopter money, whoever issues this thing called money, central bank or not central bank, comes to you directly. Doesn't trade with you. Doesn't do any open market operation. In the helicopter model of money, they Entity generating money just puts it in your pocket. 
This is important. It doesn't make the model bad or good, it makes the model appropriate to understand certain operation or other. It doesn't make the model appropriate to understand quantitative easing. It doesn't make the model appropriate to understand outright market transaction, which is quantitative easing in, in, in Frankfurt uh, uh, jargon. Okay? Why? Because they don't put money in your pocket. They're not meant to do that. They're actually meant to do something completely different. They use a notion of money completely different than money in your than purchasing power in your pocket. They actually wanted to avoid that desperately because they knew that if they put hundreds of thousands of dollars or euros in your pocket, you would go out and spend them. Right? And so it's completely idiotic to have these debates in which there is someone says, oh, the monetary theory, quantity theory money is completely wrong because there is no high inflation after quantitative easing. Why? The quantity theory of money says that if you put money in the pocket of people, people spend it and prices move proportion. That's what quantitative theory says. It doesn't say that if you change the structure of, mature, of, 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 of securities in the portfolio of, of, of commercial banks, that causes inflation. I've never read that version. If somebody has ever written that version, let me know. That guy is a moron. Okay? Models have to be taken seriously. We're not all TV commentators. This is serious because unfortunately what used to be TV commentators, now it's becoming you know, written by, 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 by economists, by, by professors, they go around saying things, they influence people. That's not what monetary theory is about. So this is the point of theory, your money in the version helicopter money. Or if you want the version you, you miss the first, probably actually it's not true. There were Spanish guys, I never, I have to, <laughs> with age, there is a couple of Italians and, and two or three Spaniards in the 16th and 17th century, the States at first. They're based on that. They're looking at the obvious observation of circulations of coins in their cities. In Spain in particular, with all the silver coming in from Potosi and from Peru and from uh, uh, you know, what was then the empire right, across the Atlantic, through Seville and, and so on. And they noticed that as the circulation of precious metals that, that, that the king turns into coins increases, there is a rampant increase in prices. There is not a particular increase of output, right? The economy is in no depression. It's not that the Spain of 1600 or late 1500 that receives all these coins from the Americas is a country where there is a lack of minimum of exchange and therefore transactions don't take place because there is not enough minimum of exchange around. Yeah, maybe in some small communities not enough minimum of exchange, but it's small potatoes. So basically when all this stuff comes in, the people that have it, typically merchants and people with economic interest in Latin America, start spending it and giving them the output of the stuff they want to buy is what it is, may go out up a bit, but not much, right? most of this silver turns into increasing the relative price of the goods with respect to silver. And people say, oh, that's the quantity theory of money. Sure, you could call it the quantity theory of potatoes, right? If the supply of potatoes suddenly increases, most likely the relative price of everything else with respect to potato goes up. <laughs> so let's try to be real. I mean, in the initial three, four, five hundred years ago, three hundred, four hundred years ago formulation of the quantity theory, it is both very correct and also very simple. Then it evolves and it becomes a specific statement about a certain quantity of objects, their speed of going around, the relative price of a certain thing, and what's crucial, transactions. This per se would be worth a class. In fact, in my class in undergrad uh, money and banking, I go all on for a long time about this. The quantity theory of money doesn't talk about GMP. The classical theory of money, and in fact the proper formulation, even these, doesn't have GMP there. That's not the price, CPI price deflator. That's a shortcut. 
or that's a simplification. If we want to put the CPI price deflator here, we better put consumption transaction here, but then we better put this also restricted to that, right? So it doesn't talk about my transaction in capital goods or my transaction in financial assets or in government bonds or any kind of bonds, right? The transactions here and the thing called money here better be defined if you want the quantity equation to make sense. Because remember that the quantity equation, no matter how much certain friends want to turn it around, is it tautology. It's an accounting identity, right? It's a good, useful way in which the only thing you compute is this. The unknown here is speed, velocity, right? Because if you measure carefully and you define this properly, if the unit of time is defined, one month, right? And M is defined precisely, M1, right? And the transaction, the set of things you want to transact is defined precisely and therefore the price also, then the only thing you don't you have to compute and the theory of is velocity. Because all the other stuff should be recorded. Then it's up to you to take one of the variables and theorize making assumption and turn what's an accounting identity to compute what in fact if you think of it an abstract parameter. Right? There's no such a thing as velocity. Or better, there is such a thing as a velocity in a very simple environment which I literally have a coin and I pass it around. Right? But try applying this to the purchase of consumption good, or consumption, durable and non-durable, in a given region in a month. You see you have a very hard task to even define what this is. Because, yes, mostly people will use things in M1, but who knows? Right? People may use credit, may pay postponed payment. Right? And some of the things in M1 may go around fast, some may go around very slowly, right? depending if the consumption measure is mostly evaded fiscally, so that it's going to be currency going around, or it's not evaded fiscally, and then there is credit card charges going around. And then how do the credit card charges get cleared? I mean, whatever, right? So, computing this thing is complicated. So actually, huh? so actually even in the best case scenario, we will get uh, the average velocity. Yeah, yeah, in general, you get the, the average velocity of this, okay? But what I'm saying is that you can make a theory out of this. Up to you. But per se, the quantity theory is just an identity. And it has that origin. And it is a world in which, yes, as, as an historian, if you want, or an economic theorist, I look at the world of 15th century, 16th, 17, 18, 19, and I think this is fine. Not as a theory of money, in the sense that I'm not necessarily convinced that this is the way to explain why people hold money. Okay? But if I have to treat money as currency, coins, minted coins that have one source, basically, the royal, the sovereign, and are more or less transmitted directly without little intermediation by the banking system, from the sovereign that spends to the public that then eventually receives it to make it go around, then I'm saying, as a first cut, there may be difference between England and Spain, Italy and France, Germany and the Netherlands, but more or less until 1820, this is fine. Or 1850, this is kind of fine. Okay? Even if, you know, <laughs> in the last hundred years of that period, the role of banking and credit and so on is growing a lot. Right? It's growing a lot. So Patinkin attempt to do this, and therefore changing the budget constraint by writing what? By saying, look, you don't have just this, you also have, you have the good you demand, okay, and 
saying they have to have a value less or equal to the market value of the goods you supply. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Plus the money, let me write it like that with capital M, that I gave you and you have in your pocket. Okay, that's how the guy starts. He says, each one of you have some money in their pocket. Notice that when you put it in that form, you, you put M without P in front, right? So that becomes the unit of measure. Right? I should stop in two minutes. And then this P, even if I'm using the same symbol, is not the same thing. Right? Because now I don't have J goods, I have J plus one. So the unit of measure of P is no longer Castraure, but Zecchini. Just to keep staying in the city. Alright? But also notice that when I write the budget constraint like that, it's incomplete, it's inconsistent. Why? There are two problems. Well, okay, there is this funny thing with which you can buy stuff, right? Because it enters on the right side of the budget constraint. So first of all, I'm assuming actually that you, everybody starts with a positive or no negative and you can buy stuff so everybody accepts it, but where does it go? Where does it go? It's not here. I won't put it here. Okay? So you see, that's why there is this. Because there's got to be a reason why you keep it. The Patinkin argument is, in fact, a, a bit of a mess. Right? There is this thing that is there. It allows for a perfect duality. It's just a veil. But on the other end, it gives utility. Yeah, put on. I mean, what he's trying to do is to put money in the simplest way. He wants to prove a theorem, to construct a model in which money is neutral and it goes that way. Again, right, models have to be interpreted, and I don't know why, I mean, I've always thought about that, but models always have to be interpreted in reverse, in my opinion. Models have to be interpreted, at least theoretical models. Empirical model is a different matter. But theoretical models have to be interpreted in the form, if the if such and such a thing had such and such properties, what would have to be true about that world? What assumptions would have to define that world? That's the way I think of it. You know? For the world for the, for the second world for theorem to be correct, to be coherent, what are the assumptions? For a competitive equilibrium to exist, what are the assumptions? For money to be neutral in competitive equilibrium, what are the assumptions? I don't believe money in neutral, I don't believe the second word for theorem applies, I don't believe we live in perfect competitive agreement, so what? Right? You're taking sections of reality, extremely low dimensional sections of reality that is very high dimensional and even non-linear and contorted. So what Don is trying to do is to say, well, you know, I want to kind of have a pure quantity theory statement in which this holds true in the aggregate. Velocity is constant because it pretty much does not have time. And there is duality. Relative price are determined here, and then the absolute level of price is determined by the quantity demanded and supplied. Okay, let's take a break.